Let me um, begin by expressing a double pleasure. Uh, firstly, the fact that after a long period of absence away from uh, the ACSS and the SLS, I'm, uh, I've been invited back. Uh, presumably, somebody must have uh, persuaded Raymond that I still possess a certain residue of utility. <laughs> <laughs> My other source of pleasure is being in uh, reunited with my old colleague uh, Bernard uh, Harbin, um, with whom in a previous life, when he was working for Defit, and uh, we had just started this association called the African Security Sector Network, which is uh, really a network of public spirited security experts who've been going around trying to support uh, African governments and uh, regional institutions like the AU and so on with security sector reform uh, issues. Um, now, that gives a certain pertinence, I think, to the uh, fact that we both appear in here and that the presentation that he just uh, gave uh, and the book that they just published uh, in a sense, carries forward some of the earlier work that we started uh, with our own publication, which remains, I think, effectively the only one of, of that sort on military budgeting uh, in Africa. Um, what the World Bank has done, and this is a point that I want to mix into my own presentation, is to two things that I, I find uh, very interesting, uh, not all of which are publicly acknowledged. Uh, the World Bank and the IMF did a lot of work in rebalancing the political relationship between ministries of finance and ministries of defense. It used to be in the bad old days of coups that in the budgeting process, people from the Ministry of Finance would throw together, often somewhat haphazardly, all these uh, excessive military budgets walk into the Ministry of Finance and basically say, this is what we want. No discussion. Under the uh, pr pr programs of structural adjustment and so on, the World Bank and the IMF now step in and say, look, we have to have financial discipline. We have to have a sense of policy process. Uh, we have to have what is today called uh, uh, public finance management, all of these attributes that good financial management should possess. Uh, and through that, we're able to bring ministries of defense uh, to some kind of uh, control uh, under the uh, overarching uh, budgetary and policy processes. Uh, but let me, while repeating in a sense rather more narrowly some of the points that he's already made, let me, let me go back to this whole debate about the linkage between security and development. It seems as if we have assumed that the relationship between security and development are so axiomatic that there is no further question, no further interrogation. Uh, the point, however, that uh, should be made, and I think in a sense, uh, Bernard already introduced it, is that this attempt to link the two actually goes way back, at least 20 or 30 years back. Uh, and what you find is a number of reformulations of this relationship with shifting political meanings and nuances. The important point, I think, that uh, we need to note here, however, which is, is already noted, is that the current formulation goes back, of course, to the UNDP concept of human security, uh, 1994. Now, it seems to me that we need to revisit that linkage uh, for a number of reasons. And this is particularly important for people in the security sector for whom there has been this inconclusive debate about how notions of human security redefine the mission of the security sector. 
Okay, um, and there's been some conversations about this and, and some debates, but nothing really uh, conclusive. Let us at least begin by pointing out that the concept of human security at the time that it appeared was a truly revolutionary one. It was revolutionary also at a number of levels. First of all, it transformed development studies, what in those days we call development studies, and at the same time transformed security studies. However, it brought the two into an oftentimes uncomfortable marriage. What do I mean by that? By this, I'm referring to the fact that it brought together two communities, both very powerful, which barely talked to each other and generated a whole set of new debates about the extent to which development agencies should go into the area of security and the extent to which uh, security agencies should take on these broader, the broader remit of, uh, of, of, of development. Now, what this meant was a number of things that a number of these security, uh, of these development agencies, which were becoming more and more powerful because of the aid that they were uh, dispensing, um, increasingly had to deal with these security issues. And if you probably remember your earlier days in DFID, there was a lot of discomfort. Development people did not want to deal with soldiers. So even though we begin to find a situation where DFID, and increasingly almost in spite of themselves, become more and more of a determinant in the security area. So we begin to find, for instance, that the whole notion of security sector reform, uh, to a very large extent, starts with development agencies like, uh, like, like DFID. On the other hand, we begin to, to, to find, particularly in Latin America, and one of the peculiar things that we see is that this concept of human security gained a great deal of traction in Africa, but none at all in Asia, and very little in Latin America. And we need to ask why. One of the reasons was this notion that the concept essentially was, secu was securitizing development. Um, and in Latin America, coming out of military authoritarianism and with a strong memory of the implications of US, the history of US civic action in Central America in particular, there was a sense that this was a, a dangerous path and that in a sense, it was remilitarizing development. So one of the, of the uh, paradoxes that they perceived in that area with this concept is that it will bring the military back into, into, uh, into the area of civic life. Now, let me give you a quick example uh, from an unnamed African country to show the kind of confusion that this could generate, uh, which was where uh, a National Security Council uh, all of a sudden went and purchased, it created a human security de uh, department, and then all of a sudden went out and purchased a huge fleet of construction trucks. And you could see these going around uh, the countryside, marked human security. And they were run by the National Security Council. So this whole notion that uh, somehow the military in particular uh, should justify its existence by showing that it had a certain developmental utility uh, became one of the, of the, of the uh, uh, issues. Uh, but the other thing that I think was important was that this whole notion of a linkage between security and development or human security occurred on particularly the cusp of developments in the global economy that made the whole project of human security increasingly questionable. And this is the point that I want to develop a, a little further. First of all, neoliberalism and increasingly globalization took away from states the policy tools that they had traditionally used to generate social solidarity and consent. Now, of course, this is debatable, I know, you know, because uh, it was the same behavior that the literature tended to call patrimonial. So a lot of people thought, well, this is a structural adjustment. It's a cure 
to patrimonialism. But at the same time, it meant that states lost that, those policy tools that they needed to uh, more or less uh, ingratiate, if you want, uh, their national populations. The second development which undercut human security was, of course, in the 1990s, as we know, the uh, escalation or proliferation of violent conflicts, particularly in Africa, which uh, again increasingly meant that international, the international community, international agencies uh, no longer had the assurance of the traditional tools of conflict management, the traditional tools of peace mediation, of peacekeeping, and so on. Uh, so we begin to enter into a very fraught international context that at multiple levels uh, increasingly uh, undercut the prospects of, uh, of, uh, of, of human security. Uh, let, let me um, uh, cut this uh, to the chase very quickly. Um, I think one should also point out that a further refinement of the security development linkage uh, now occurred through the notion of fragile states. In other words, the question was now asked, why is it that we get in neither security nor development? And the answer was fragile states. Fragile states were those entities unable to offer either security or development or basic services to their populations. And we begin to find the international community increasingly focusing or refocusing on fragile states with a number of consequences. The first is that there was a securitization of this whole fragile state paradigm. Fragile states were seen as a danger increasingly to international security. Why? Because they harbored terrorists. You remember when uh, Osama bin Laden was in Sudan and Afghanistan uh, and so on. So dealing with fragile states becomes increasingly a focal point of US foreign policy in particular, and increasingly the, the whole international security system, the UN uh, uh, in included. Um, now, paradoxically, this whole notion of dealing with fragile states increasingly also runs aground on the structural fragilities entailed in lack of development. If you look at all the post-conflict uh, states and the reforms and so on, even when those reforms are reasonably successful in countries like Sierra Leone, Liberia, and so on, what increasingly undermines this whole uh, progress or progression is precisely, of course, lack of development, low social indicators, uh, and so on. But the important thing now to, to uh, bring to our attention is the increasing divergence of security issues and development issues for a very simple reason, that the international community is now so focused on stabilization and restoring state authority that the whole network of the state system in the international order is focused on reasserting command of the domain. At the same time, interestingly, because of globalization, states have less and less control over international financial and economic flows. So in other words, at the same time as states are galvanizing to deal with the issue of security through primarily and principally the restoration of state authority, they're losing control over economic circuits. Now, this is not just an African problem or a third world problem. We cannot understand what is happening with France in the last elections, the US with Trump, and this whole complaint about globalization and so on without understanding that this is where states, in essence, are losing control uh, over, over the, uh, the global uh, environment. Uh, two final very quick remarks. Uh, African growth patterns, 
are verifying this conflict or conflicting outcomes for so-called development on the one hand and uh, security on the other. If you look at the international trade of African countries over the last 10 years, so at least between 2004 and 2014-15, we find that Africa actually had the higher growth rate of any continent. However, there was something wrong with this growth rate, the whole thrust of growth. Firstly, it was predominantly commodities, which meant that African countries were losing the resilience and the integrated nature that African governments had worked on for so many years. Under the thrust of globalization, African economies, in other words, have shrunk back to a commodities base. That's point number one. And therefore, this again is a principal element of fragility. The second element is that this growth was non redistributive. In other words, we, began, we begin to see where inequalities are increasing, unemployment is increasing, and basically we're dealing with what people call um, non inclusive growth. This is particularly manifest, of course, with what uh, youth unemployment. And that's why we, we, we see this paradox that at the very time that African economies were growing most rapidly, you also get this, this mass migration, this dangerous migration, particularly of young Africans, and this whole rush uh, to go to, uh, to, to Europe or abroad or whatever. So what it means is that this particular form of growth actually intensifies marginalization and alienation. Um, so clearly, uh, the point I'm making is that, in a certain sense, we get a departure, not a convergence of security and development, but a departure of, uh, of uh, security and development. Finally, then, the, the uh, rather difficult question that we will be discussing, which is, what does this all mean for those of you in the security sector? Uh, what, what can people in the security sector do to promote a linkage between security and, uh, and development? Uh, frankly, probably not very, not very much. Uh, this was an issue that we discussed a lot in our, our Ghana workshops. You know, what does human security mean? How does it change the mission? of the security sector, and particularly the mission of the military. Obviously, the whole notion that, therefore, the military goes back to taking up development tasks uh, is a non-starter. Uh, but then what is the uh, response? I would imagine, and uh, I'm only throwing this out uh, to begin with, that this will be only conceivably within the context of the development of a national security policy framework and strategy, which brings together the diverse political, institutional, social, and other interests in a, in a, a, a dialogue and a conversation about what it is that the nation needs and what it is that security sector in particular can contribute. I mean, obviously, there, there are forms of security practice that are corrosive of development and forms that hopefully yet to be discovered that are more affirmative of, of development. But the interesting thing is that already in the conversations this morning, we've gotten a hint of some of the blockages uh, when somebody said uh, very plaintively that the politicians don't listen uh, to security people. Um, and there have been uh, several similar uh, whatever. So what we have uh, around uh, many African countries is this peculiar dialogue of the deaf. Okay, so uh, military people in particular constantly complain that when they have a, 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 you know, a, a strategic uh, framework uh, commended to government, uh, government 
hardly ever listens. And unless we break down these uh, blockages, and I, I think, of course, that this environment uh, is very productive, uh, far away from uh, the constraints of our own environment back home. And there was somebody who said, why can't we have these conversations back home? Uh, yeah, uh, they cost money, for one thing. And as uh, Chester Crocker pointed out this morning, whenever you mention money, Africa has to go abroad to look for uh, funding and, uh, and so on. But this is where we need to begin to, to, to look. And I hope that we can pick this up in a way that is familiar to your own experience.